We thank you that all that we have, are, and can be comes from your generous hand. As we thank you for the gifts you give, lead us to manage wisely all you provide. We praise you, Heavenly Father, that you gave your only Son on the cross that we might have life. We praise you, Lord Jesus, for the price you paid and the life you gave. We praise you, Holy Spirit, for the spirit of community and generosity you lead us to live. In your name, O God, I pray. Amen. Invite you to pull out the message insert in your order of service and take notes on this morning's message. Our 75th anniversary happens next year, and so in preparation for that, we're looking at some of the values that, that God has placed in our church that are timeless, that are part of our past, kind of fuel our present, and lead us into the future. And we're focusing on different decades. This decade that we're looking at this morning is a glimpse a little bit at the 1970s. I'm just curious, if you joined Christ Lutheran in the 1970s, would you stand up that we might thank God for leading you to this place? Thank you, you may be seated. Thank you very much. David writes these words in 2 Chronicles 29, verses 14 through 16. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. We are aliens and strangers in your sight, as were all our forefathers. Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. O Lord our God, as for all this abundance that we have provided for building you a temple for your holy name, it comes from your hand, and all of it belongs to you. One of my favorite events at Christ Lutheran is at Thanksgiving when we kind of cover the front with food. People bring financial gifts, but, but they bring non-perishable food items to, to help people in our community, and I'm always amazed by the level of generosity. I never knew how to describe that until I heard a podcast by a Christian comedian named Michael Jr. And Michael Jr. was speaking at a church, and he got serious for a moment, and he used this word, communerosity. He said it's community plus generosity equals communerosity. So what is communerosity? Communerosity is a generous attitude that combines with generous actions to create for community. It invests in community. And this morning, that's what we're going to look at. How, how do we move to communerosity? How, how do we cultivate a spirit of generosity that impacts the lives of other people? During the 1970s, we tapped once again into the timeless value of community through generosity. We moved our bell tower. So here's a picture. So if you look at your bulletin cover, somebody asked me the first Sunday they saw that, they go, hey, I'm trying to figure out where the bell tower is in this picture and how that works. Well, it used to be like back here, and then it got moved up there in various pieces. And then the whole courtyard area and modern two classrooms were added to the school back in the 70s that we wanted to build community. People generously gave so that community could be built and experienced. And as we dig into God's Word today, we're going to look at the three lessons that were read earlier. They each speak of, of some aspect of generosity that builds community. Uh, David, in, in 1 Chronicles 29, talks about this foundational belief uh, about stuff, whether it be money or not money, and how it impacts our life. Paul talks about the importance of how to excel in, in this gift of giving, and this grace of giving is the phrase he uses. And then Jesus kind of brings in a divine perspective of how generosity impacts our heart. And that all kinds of moves to kind of who we are. So why concern over communerosity? We live in a country that's dealing with division in community. From racial tensions, to political candidates, to moral issues. It feels at times there's more that divides us than unites us. And our community needs us to be generous. Here's another little secret. You and I need to be generous. It, it shapes our hearts. It shapes our hearts with the joy that God gives. 
And it leads us to live that kind of life that God's invited us to live. Moving to communerosity is an invitation to, to, to make a difference, to change a home, to change a neighborhood, change a church, change a community, change a country, to change our world. Now, I, I know what some of you are thinking at this point. Oh, this is the money talk. Why, why did I come today? Okay, between you and me, I bet you spent money this week. Money's part of life. And the Bible's about life. But if you think generosity only involves money, you're, you're missing the whole other side of generosity. So we're going to look at money, because that's part of it. But we're going to look at what's not money, because that's part of it too. And God's concerned about both. In fact, God's concerned not only about what we give with our money and our time and our abilities, God's concerned about what we keep and, and how we use that as well. And, and looking at these three lessons that were read earlier, it weaves together this idea that, that God, God has made us to be like Him. God wants you and me to, to know the joy of generosity and how living out that joy can change a community. Let's start with David's observation here, that why he gives to build the temple. Uh, look what it says here in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 12. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. It turns out David didn't build the temple, but he gave the financial gift that was the major funding for the temple. His son Solomon will build the temple. But David gives extremely generously. Dave Ramsey, who's like a financial guru, he's got Financial Peace University, uh, he actually sat down and figured out what in today's dollars David's gift would add up to. So tell the person beside you what you think the amount in today's dollars would be of the financial gift that King David made to build the temple back then. Go ahead and give him a, a dollar figure. $21 billion. Makes Bill Gates' gifts look a little cheap, don't you think? Yeah. $21 billion. To build a temple he will never see. He will never worship in that temple. But because of what God has done in his life, he wants to respond back. He wants to build a place for community where the people he leads will encounter God and have a stronger love for each other. Uh, look at what he says here in 1 Chronicles 29, 14. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you. And we have given you only what comes from your hand. The first lesson I learned about moving to communerosity that I learned from David is everything I have comes from God. God is the owner. I am simply the manager. That, that's a timeless value. That goes back to the story of creation. God creates the world and he creates people so that we might manage what, what he's given us. Timeless is a whole lot different than trendy. Trendy kind of comes in and out. So think of these trends from the 1970s, which, thank God, are not timeless. Uh, leisure suits. Okay, true confession time. How many of you had a leisure suit? In case you still have one, they are out of style now. At one point, I owned three leisure suits. I thank God there are no pictures of me to blackmail me in a leisure suit. I remember watching like the Today Show one morning for some reason, and the fashion person was on there and was saying, the leisure suit is the suit of today and the future and for all time. Well, thank God that didn't work out. Or how about this one, disco dancing, which is why we needed leisure suits and Saturday night fever. Those trends have come. Those trends, in many ways, have, have gone. In a trendy world, 
the best things are timeless. In a trendy world, we seek to be a church of timeless value. Everything you and I have, it comes from God. And God invites us to be like Him, to be generous with what He gives. When Paul speaks of generosity, he's, he's seeking to raise dollars to help the poor in Jerusalem. And he's writing to a church kind of in Greece. And he says this words to the church in Corinth and to us today. Well, look what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness and in your love for us, see that you excel in this grace of giving. I like that phrase, grace of giving. Grace is just a, simply a word that means gift, the, the, the gift of giving. Our goal as a church is not to guilt you into giving. It can be done. It works quite effectively. But, but we believe that giving flows out of grace. It's not a response to like earn God's love, but it's a way that we express our thanks to Him. We thank Him for all that He gives. We, he's the owner. We're the managers. We show wise management by by what he gives us. And the key to all that is what Paul says here in verse 5. He's writing about people in Macedonia, poor people in Macedonia. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. To give generously in the Christian sense, whether it's money or not money, flows out of a relationship with God. When we look at moving to communerosity, Paul teaches this lesson, it's the second lesson, excel in the grace of giving flows from giving my heart first to Jesus. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Jesus died on a cross to pay the price for our sins that we might have life with God. He gave the greatest gift, he made the ultimate sacrifice. And God calls us not, not out of guilt, but out of grace, out of gratitude to, to give to Him. And yeah, that involves money, but that also involves not money. Are you generous with your finances, but are you generous with your faith? Odds are, one of the first words you ever said, probably one of the first ten words, was mine. Just, just try it. My granddaughter's not talking yet, but I'm guessing this is going to be in her skill set. You take your kids out for lunch. They have french fries. You don't. You, you just want one. You reach over and they go, mine. You didn't pay for that. <laughs> Owners and managers. But by our sinful nature, I'll just speak for myself, I'm greedy. But out of God's grace, you and I can be generous. And we can enjoy this great life that God has given us. With money and with not money. So let's talk about not money. What do you do with your time? Well, one thing is what you're doing right now. Your gift to God of time is gathering for worship. It's spending time with Him and His Word. It's helping other people. It's serving in community. One of the ways we do that as a church happens this month. It's pick up the park event. You can sign up out there. There's information in your announcement page. But since the city of La Mesa started that a number of years ago, what we have helped out. We come alongside. We go to a park and... Last year, somebody had this brilliant idea. We should have a barbecue for, like, all the volunteers. What do you think about that? I'm there. They put me in another park, but I found where the barbecue was. I'm, I'm, I'm there. Why do we do that? We, we believe God called us not just to be here in community, but to be in our community, building community. And so last year it was two parks. One park uh, was to remove weeds and one park was to plant plants. They sent me to the weed removal 
and they had the barbecue where we were planting plants. You, you go where your gifts are. You use the abilities God has given you. One path of generosity with not money is it's the reason why we do the Grow, Pray, Study Guide. So if you look at like pages three and four each week, you'll, you'll see that there's opportunity to spend time in God's Word that's based on the message this week. And um, If you look at Wednesday, Wednesday this week provides an opportunity to read that verse 7 from 2 Corinthians 8. But also to kind of see where I used to think that the difference was either you're a giver or you're not a giver. But, but to become generous, there's typically some steps that you follow. It's not like I was not giving and all of a sudden I woke up generous. There's typically some steps you follow to grow in that. And so we're going to walk through these four steps. And you'll have an opportunity on Wednesday, if not sooner, to reflect on that. Uh, step one, become a first-time giver. If you want to excel in the grace of giving, well, you start by becoming a first-time giver. John D. Rockefeller gave away millions of dollars. He was asked how he was able to give away that much money. He said, I could never have given away millions of dollars if I hadn't given away the first dollar. So if you've never made a financial gift in, in a church, that, that this is your opportunity. You can do that. This, if you forgot, you can always go online at ChristLaMesa.org and give there. Well, what about not money, though? Well, maybe you know a friend that's going through a difficult time. You call them up. You ask to go visit. And maybe instead of always telling your story, you listen to their story. You hear what, what they're going through. You spend time with them. But the first step to generosity is to become a first-time giver. Maybe it's in your home. Maybe you have chores that you're supposed to do. But the first step is you do something you're not required to do, but you know needs to be done. You will shock your family and put a smile on God's face. Here's the second step. So the first step is you give the first time, but the second step is you become a regular giver. Uh, most people feel generous. They're, they're, they're kind of moved by emotion. That, that's why they give the first time. Uh, we exhibit this at Christmas. We, we give to build a, a house, for example, with a moor, in Mexico. At Christmas and Easter, uh, we now give our offerings away on both of those events to causes in our world and community that are outside our congregation. We give to make a difference out there. And one of them is, is building homes in Mexico. And so people are moved by, by that cause. Their heart is touched and they respond. And maybe that's how you became a first-time giver. Becoming a regular giver says something like this, with money. It says, when, when I get paid, whether that's like weekly, twice a month, or once a month, I, I give that to God first. I give a portion of that back to God, thanking Him for the work He gave me to do and for the income He provided. But maybe with the not money stuff, it's just saying, okay, God, I'm going to give you worship time each weekend. I'm going to build time with you each weekend. I'm going to be intentional about serving an area. I'm going to put it in my calendar. Uh, again, it, it, it should happen just as life unfolds, but there is something about marking it in your calendar, of setting aside specific time to serve, to spend time with God that makes a difference. Now, just helping people out, that, that used to be known as random acts of kindness, how about if we called them intentional acts of generosity? Most people go into a situation and the, the question they ask is, what am I going to get out of this? What's the benefit for me in this situation? The advantage of being a regular giver, generous person, money, not money, is you start to develop a habit which says, well, what can I give to this situation? God, why have you placed me at this place? Why, why did you bring that person alongside me? What, what difference can I make to help here? 
See, the advantage of step one is when you give the first time, you experience the, the joy of generosity. When you volunteer the first time, you experience the joy of generosity. You, you, you begin to understand that, that you're not an accident, that God put you in this world for a specific purpose. The advantage of step two is that it develops a habit of generosity in life. It's not just like accident here, accident there. It's, it's an intentional part of, of who you are. The, the generous muscle begins to grow. Step three is to, to become a tither. With the money side of generosity, if you're a regular, a, a tither is simply somebody who gives their first 10% of income back to God. Not the last 10% because it's never there, but it's, it's the first 10%. That, that goes back to God. That, that's kind of the biblical foundation for giving. I learned that habit of tithing as a sixth grader. In my church in Confirmation, they, they taught that. And at that time, it was kind of easy. I was making $10 a week doing chores around the house and mowing yards. And uh, the first dollar then went back to God. And that, that was kind of simple math. $10, $1, yeah, I can do that in my head. Give that back to God. I was fortunate that way. That, that made the habit a whole lot easier. That point of life when I was making $100, it was easier to give $10 back because I'd learned the 1 in 10 deal. For some people, I know that's difficult. Amazingly, the trend is the higher you go up in income, the smaller percentage that you actually give. I don't understand that. You would think it would work the other way because you've got your basic necessities covered. But part of that is, is learning that habit early. So when it comes to not money, how, how do you tithe there? Well, again, you do, you do what you're doing right now. You say, God, Sunday mornings are yours. I'm going to spend time worshiping you weekly. And you set aside time each day, whether you use the GPS or some other method, spend, spend time in God's Word. You build it into your calendar I'm going to serve at this place at this time to honor you, Lord. Here, here's step four. You see, the first three steps I learned by sixth grade. I, I began to learn the joy of giving. Step four didn't happen until like ten years ago. And that's to become an extravagant giver. I lived on, I, I gave the first ten percent to God, checked that box off, good to go, thank you, Lord, happy day. But then I learned that's kind of the foundation. That, that, I thought it was the end game. Actually, it's the foundation point. And about nine, ten years ago, we were kind of in a financial crunch. And I stood up and said, hey, if you're able to give a little bit more, can you give a little bit more? And I thought if I was going to ask you to do that, uh, Sharon and I should do that. And so uh, we kind of increased our tithe, not a whole lot, but we did go over the 10% mark, which was all new math to me. And then I found out there were other causes in the world. I kept hearing about compassion children. So uh, last year we committed to a compassion child, not as part of our tithe, but above and beyond our tithe. It was simply an offering of thanksgiving. We have a heart for India. It was a child from India. We are the worst compassion people. Not money giving in our family would be, we've got to start writing a note to the nice girl that we're compassion parents for. That would be a step of growth for me. I just made the step three and figured it was over. And then I found out there's just a whole new level out there. When you invest your time in serving somebody, when you experience that joy of financially giving and the difference it makes. See, serving should define who you are, not what you occasionally do. And by building such generosity, building that mindset into who we are, by giving ourselves first to God and by serving... Not, not to impress God, but simply to thank Him. It just makes a tremendous difference. Now, wh why such concern about those four steps of communerosity, of generosity? It really flows out of what Jesus says. Look at, listen again to what He says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you've ever bought stock, you know this. Let, let's say, for example, let's say you bought some Disney stock. And all of a sudden, your perspective of the Disney company changes. Let's say but even before that, you had an annual pass, so you thought you'd buy some Disney stock. And you're reading in the paper, and it says, uh, Disney's attendance is up 10% this year. They are packed out. 
Before you would have moaned saying, oh, next time we go, we got to just wait in these awful lines. But now you're going, stock is going up, baby. About a month later, you read that because attendance is going up, they've raised the ticket prices, $10 a ticket. Before you were going, oh. But now you're going, $5 a share or more. You haven't seen a Disney movie in 20 years, but you found out that the latest one is number one in the box office. You are cheering. Why? You own Disney stock. And you care about what happens to Disney stock. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See, Jesus shares this great divine perspective to help us understand why it is so vital that we be generous people. My heart will follow where my giving goes. That's true of money. That's true of not money, of time and everything else. That, that, that's why I'm passionate about you and I and our church being generous to build community because that's where our heart's supposed to go. That, that's where our world needs us to go. That's where our community right here in East County needs us as well. Sixteen years ago, we partnered with Mission India. We committed to fund 10 church planters, and we've continued that since then every year. It's part of our, our budget. I don't know if you know it. 12.5% of our budget goes to causes outside of our congregation. One of them is Mission India. So we keep funding class after class of church planters because the, the need is so great over there. In the 16 years that we have been a partner with Mission India, over 5,000 people have come to faith. 5,000 people. Look, all I knew about India 17 years ago was there was a show named Johnny Quest, and he had a friend named Raj, and Raj was from India. It's worse. When I got to go to India for the first time, I was so excited because I've always wanted to go south of the equator and then I found out that India was not south of the equator. I could have stayed home. And yet, God, God has used what we have done to impact not only us, and not only India, but other churches. So last week, I was, my daughters both go to the same church. One works there, and the other with her husband and our grandchild goes there, and that's where uh, our granddaughter got baptized. So they have flags of countries they support up in their church, and they just added a new flag. It's of India. Why did they do that? They heard our story. They understood the difference that was made. Where our heart has gone, it has led other people to follow. Can you understand why in a community that is divided, in a country that is divided, Communerosity, community plus generosity could make an incredible impact uh, in our world. In a world filled with uncertainty and tension, we need places of communerosity. God has placed us here in La Mesa, in East County, to build such a community. And my prayer today is that God, out of His grace, is leading you to a generous spirit. And some of that might be challenging with money or with not money. And there's just three words I want you to think about. Trust and obey. Like David, trust that God is the provider of all things. That where you live, who you are, what you can do, all the money you have, that we worship here, comes as God's gift. And we trust Him. And we obey Him. Or like Paul telling the Corinthians, look, the, the, the best step in giving to excel in the grace of giving is first you give yourself to the Lord. And then you let how you manage your money and, and your life, you, you let it flow out of that. You, you trust God and you obey what he's calling you to do. And, and like Jesus, where your treasure is, where your trust is, where your obedience is, there your heart will also follow. God is calling us to be a community of generosity, not just to bless us in here, but that we go out into our community 
and we transform it for all eternity. We bow our heads to pray. Thank you, Lord, for desiring to make us generous people who live in community, in our community, where the tension is high and the need for you even greater. Help us to live out with generosity, with money and what is not money, so that community is built. Holy Spirit, lead us to the next step in the generosity journey you desire for each of us to take. We praise you for your example of community and generosity and for your desire to build a community spirit through us. And all God's people said, Amen.